Hi everyone, welcome to our very first MotoQuest adventure webinar. Uh, today we have MotoQuest founder and world traveler Phil Freeman coming to us live from Anchorage, Alaska uh, to talk about motorcycle touring in Japan. Say hi Phil. Hi everyone. I'd also like to introduce uh, with me today Brendan Anders. He's our general manager and he is a lead guide for us and has been on numerous tours. He'll be sitting in with us today as well. All right, say hi Brendan. Hey everybody. All right. Uh, I'm Brent Wallace. I'm your moderator today. I'm with Acorn Woods Communications. Um, to start us all off, I think I'm going to show a couple of photos here that have been taken on past Japan uh, MotoQuest adventures. So give me just a second here to pull those up. I might fill the space by just saying that I lived in and worked in Japan for a couple of years back in the 90s. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to learn the language of Japanese and also that's when I started riding motorcycles and uh, the more I rode over there the more I realized what a special place it is uh, for example this uh, this photo right here is taken along the caldera of Mount Aso which is one of the largest uh, calderas in the world and uh, it's known as the road to the sky and it's just a little farmer one lane paved road it's off the beaten track uh, and uh, it just gives you a little taste of uh, what's out there to explore. Now, right here, uh, the, the trip itself encompasses three of the main um, Japanese islands. There's actually 3,000 islands in Japan, but there are four main ones. And this one's off the north coast of Honshu uh, on the Sea of Japan side. And this is just a little up and back we do uh, over to a little island and back uh, during our, our day there. Here's a good example of what we'll be seeing in uh, the start of April. And this is the cherry blossom season. And the cherry blossom time in Japan is a very spiritual, very important time. It's a time for barbecues and family gatherings. Uh, and also the, um, the cherry blossoms only peak four days out of the year. So we always come the very first week of April, and we're able to, at least at one point during the week, see the blossoms at their very finest. Uh, this one is uh, the Black Castle in Okayama. We start and end our trip in the city of Okayama. Uh, this Black Castle is from the year uh, 1600, a little bit before, uh, it's, uh, it was renovated after being bombed in World War II, but the, um, the garden that is across the pond from uh, it, we uh, spend a day there, the Kyo Rakuin. It's uh, one of three major uh, gardens, celebrated gardens in the nation of Japan, and it's well worth the day just to stroll through there and see what kind of beautiful, uh, ornate uh, gardening uh, the Japanese can do. It's beautiful. Uh, and here's a typical meal uh, on the road. It has all sorts of things. You can see over on the left side there's a cover. It's over a little sterno. You probably have a little bit of uh, beef there. Uh, and then you're going to have a variety of sushis. Uh, usually you have over 20 little dishes even in breakfast. So you're real busy trying all sorts of things. If you're not into sushi, don't worry. There's always enough to pick around to eat. I've been told by the riders that uh, even though they're not sushi aficionados, uh, they find plenty to eat. And uh, it's really fun because you just serve this. You sit down, uh, and all of a sudden you have uh, your work ahead of, <laughs> cut out ahead of you. <laughs> uh, and this is Mount Aso. This is a steaming caldera, and you can't actually go there every day because of the winds and the sulfuric uh, nature of the, the gases coming out of that caldera. Um, but we climb to the top of this, so we ride up there and walk over and peer down. And uh, it's really beautiful. If you, After spending a week in Japan, you quickly realize that this whole um, uh, group of islands, is, it's all volcanic. And there are many steaming uh, volcanic, uh, volcanoes that we go by even in one day. And here's another, I think this is, this might be, yeah, this is a dinner. And uh, this is typical. Uh, we'll have our own private room. Um, and you sit down, and all of a sudden, 
uh, they'll they'll come in and light all the sternos, and you have more uh, <laughs> work ahead of you. There's all sorts of different t treats I in your future. Yeah, you weren't kidding about all those little plates. I can see almost every one of those tables is overflowing. Yeah, here's another good example. And food in Japan is not only just food, it's about color, and it's about texture and balance. And so uh, they, they go through great lengths to make a very fine presentation. Don't be surprised to feel like you're royalty uh, during your week in Japan. That's quite a spread. Yeah, this one's uh, called Shabu Shabu, and those who are not familiar with that, uh, you see the rolling, boiling uh, pot in the center. looks sort of like a donut, and what they did is put vegetables in there, and then what you do is you take the thinly sliced meat, both fish and beef, and you uh, just kind of drape them in there with your uh, chopsticks, and it makes the sound Shabu Shabu. <laughs> Uh, and this one is the uh, the dome, the very famous dome in uh, Hiroshima. And at the end of the trip, uh, we decided to keep this in the package deal to uh, spend the afternoon in Hiroshima and go to the war, um, uh, the peace park. Uh, and t you'll be able to uh, stroll by the dome and actually go to the very center where the bomb blasted and, and then also go have a... Uh, uh, streamside uh, picnic um, right underneath the cherry blossoms but uh, one thing about going to Hiroshima uh, is that it's it's actually such a positive experience to see how vibrant the city is and, and how welcoming it is and also it's it's really an education for just being uh, human it's I think it's one of the most important places a person could could go on this earth now that building has been left since, uh, you know, in its exact condition since the bomb went off? Yeah. Um, what happened was, of all the other buildings, this one was in concrete and steel. It was made by a Czechoslovakian architect. And uh, he clearly made it very, very strong. The bomb actually went off before it hit the ground for maximum effect. And uh, it took the full brunt of this. It's only a couple blocks off where the, the actual bomb went off, you know, from straight above. And it withstood it, and if you see all the pictures of Hiroshima, this is the iconic uh, dome that you see. Wow, that's incredible. All right, it looks like the uh, route map here. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of lead uh, folks to see what they're getting into. In Japan, there's uh, lots of islands. It stretches all the way from the north of Hokkaido to the south of Okinawa, and it, it you know, latitude-wise, it's anywhere from Oregon to the very southern part of uh, Baja California. So there's a lot of different climates. There's a lot of uh, lot to discover there. Uh, in this particular tour, we spend eight days uh, on three different islands. So we do a large circle on the southern part of Honshu, and then we go on to Kyushu, uh, and then we take a ferry over to Shikoku. And all three islands are very similar in many ways, but what you'll find also with microclimates and uh, also, just a kind of little mini cultural enclaves. You, you get a taste that there is a distinction between each region. And uh, by the time you're done with the week, you're going to have your favorites. Um, and then you're going to find out how ruggedly mountainous uh, Japan really is. It's, uh, it's just strikingly beautiful. And the group uh, of riders that I, uh, I worked with in order to make this tour happen they're all uh, Japanese. They belong to a BMW, a Fixionado club, and they all knew, know the best routes in their region. So they put their heads together to put uh, a, a route that went away from highways as much as possible and maximized on um, the real Japan. The best riding, the best curves, the most elevation change, and no stoplights. So when you ride this, you realize, wow, I'm, I'm seeing stuff that I've you, you really can't imagine. It's not the Japan that you're used to. It's it's really very uh, rural and very scenic. That sounds great. What are we looking at here? Ah, there's two major religions. Uh, there's the Shinto religion, which is this. This is a Shinto temple or shrine. 
and then there's the Buddhist temple. And uh, they, the Japanese incorporated Buddhism into their religion quite, quite. Uh, it just it conforms very well with their old Shinto beliefs. And this is a, this is part of one of the shrines. It's outside. We visit a couple of them on the way, and they're tucked away in certain places. And sometimes they're centralized. And always there's a story, uh, a profound history. Some of them are uh, over 1,500 years old, and uh, it, they're very beautiful. And there is a very uh, peaceful atmosphere there, and it's it's uh, it's a must to to stroll through these areas. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the slideshow. Um, let me bring back my screen here. Okay. Um, well, over the past uh, week or so, we've been putting together a list of questions um, about touring in Japan, um, just traveling in general in the area. Um, so I'll throw it out to both of you guys, uh, and I'll let you guys answer, um, you know, some questions here. Uh, let me pull it up. All right. Um, so the first question here is about the accommodations on the trip. Now, reading through the description on the website, I've seen um, there's a lot of mention of, like, more traditional Japanese travel lodges. Um, so why don't you guys elaborate a little bit on what all is involved in that, because that sounds like kind of a unique experience. Okay. Uh, Brendan might be able to lead and just say uh, what we usually offer in a general trip, since he's been on so many, and then I can tell you what's specific in Japan. What do you think, Brendan? Well, our accommodations are usually best available options, so it depends on where you're at. Um, in Alaska, the best available option may be a work camp, which is a converted Connex container. Um, you go to a place like South Africa, best available option is a five-star private bungalow. So we try and keep people comfortable, but at the end of the day, uh, things can be a little spartan sometimes. Um, in Japan, it's very well uh, developed. Uh, they have a what they call yokans, which are travel lodges, and they're traditional uh, travel lodges for Japan. They're usually tatami floors. There's uh, very little um, furniture. There's uh, when you come to your room, you'll op you'll slide open the door, and there'll be absolutely nothing but a, a small uh, table right in the center of the room with maybe some hot tea. Uh, but there's nothing else, and you wonder where your bed is or where you're going to sleep. But what happens is, um, and there'll also be set aside a kimono for you, and a kimono is uh, evening garb that you can wear uh, if the hotel or, or has a hot springs or something like that. You can wear that to the hot springs, and also the guests also use it to wear to the uh, dinner. So you put that on, you don that, they have a uh, little cute socks that you put on that have individual toes and stuff like this and you kind of dress up and then you go to dinner uh, and usually the dinner will range from our own private room in a larger hotel or we'll be in a smaller uh, hotel where we are the only guests and while we're at dinner uh, the staff will go to your room they'll go to the closets and they'll pull out the futons and they'll roll them out and the, or yeah, they'll put them on the floor and when you come back everything's been rearranged and it's time to sleep and they'll reverse it again when you go to breakfast and when you go to breakfast you come back and it's all uh, cleaned up so uh, that's how the, it usually runs when you enter a traditional travel lodge generally shoes are off uh, so they'll have a distinct area where you kinda of back yourself back in you kick off both of the shoes and then they'll have a shoe area where you put it in this case we're all motorcycle riders and so uh, I remember one of the lodges that we come to, we usually uh, have a lot, <laughs> if it's raining, we have these wet boots and we're a little bit uh, nervous about what we do, but the staff is always right there and they take care of it. And what they'll do is they'll clean all the boots and for the <laughs> next day you come out and they're all lined up and ready, sparkling for the next day of journey. So it's pretty, uh, very well organized, that's for sure. But uh, you're, you're always aware of your shoes in Japan. Uh, there's there's special slippers for uh, the bathroom, um, and it's not uncommon for foreigners to forget to bring the slippers back out and into the main. And they'll catch you, and they'll go, no, 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 they only belong for the two steps in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, and it's pretty funny that way. But, uh, yeah, it's just a, it, there's, there's definitely an outdoor and an indoor uh, 
ch change of atmosphere, and you're very aware of it by the time the week is over, and you're very good at getting your boots off and putting them back on. That, yeah, I bet. <laughs> Um, in that, you brought up the hot springs, and I know in some of our previous conversations you've mentioned that there's sort of an etiquette surrounding those and that it's pretty important. Um, can you elaborate on some of that? Sure. Uh, bathing is very important in Japan. Uh, it's a communal way of uh, equalizing the social uh, network, so when you're in the baths, uh, you are in the baths, and it doesn't matter your rank in society. And the fact that it's so volcanic, uh, there are literally thousands of established um, hot springs everywhere. And we stay at a hot springs nearly every night in Japan. And it's usually subdivided between men and women. And uh, it's, it's fully no clothes on. There's a liturgy about it that you want to follow so that you don't uh, step on any cultural toes. It's not so difficult, but it does help to uh, – what I'll do with uh, – our writers is I'll send out a, a YouTube which generally teaches you how to do it and basically when you go into the hot springs you have just a little towel you have a little locker where you leave your stuff and you go in and there's these little stalls with a little seat and you rinse yourself off and then you go and bathe uh, in all the different pools and usually there's a sauna and an outdoor pool and there's all sorts there's cold pools and then when you're done you go back to the stalls and you sit down and then you have all the shampoo and conditioner and soap is there for you and you just wash yourself down while you're sitting and there's a shower head and you can use that and then uh, then you're good to go there's little things like don't jump directly into the the hot springs you gotta rinse yourself off uh, and also uh, try to keep the towel out of the water uh, other than that uh, it's it's pretty uh, at first uh, many of my guests feel a little bit you know anxious about it because it's so new and there's the the whole nudity thing that by the end of the week they go where's the hot springs I want to go there and you become quite addicted to it and you yeah, it's it so really nice, nice and refreshing after a day of writing yeah I could definitely see why they're into it um, well that sounds great okay well uh, We'll move on here. You talked about food earlier when we were showing some of the slides. Um, tell us a little bit about what kind of food you can expect. Um, I know a lot of it showed a lot of seafood and stuff like that, but you've said there's other things that you can choose from too. Sure. Uh, they're, they basically exercise their omnivore rights very well. Uh, so you'll have anything from pork to chicken to beef uh, and all sorts of fish. And uh, the diet is just high in protein. I've had folks eat everything on every meal and still lose weight. Uh, it's or it's it's all fresh, uh, and it's it's very good for you, and it's it's tasty. And there's a lot of different there's a lot of varieties. You have a lot going on in even one little uh, set meal where you'll have a piece of uh, beef cooking on one side, and you'll have sushi on the other, and then. They'll keep rotating in like a little custards uh, made with, from eggs, and then uh, there'll be all sorts of sashimi, and it, it just keeps coming. And uh, one of my favorites, uh, we'll stop always at a ramen shop and order a ramen, a real ramen from Japan, which is excellent. And usually it comes with the different kinds of sauces, uh, shoyu or miso, and they have all sorts of different other kinds of options. Um, I'll also take people in those are breaded cutlet, pork cutlet, which is excellent. Um, and then uh, you'll just have your, you know, um, sometimes we'll even stop at like a roadside area. It's kind of, it's not the fanciest, but it is what the Japanese do eat. And they'll have a little vending machine with all the pictures, and you just purchase a little ticket, and you bring it over the counter, and they call you. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, it's, there's a whole variety of, I think food is probably one of the biggest reasons or, uh, to enjoy Japan. They, they just... Uh, they take a lot of time and effort into it, and it uh, it's delicious. Once you have food in Japan, you go back to a Japanese restaurant uh, back home, and that's when the crying starts. <laughs> Doesn't quite compare, huh? Um, okay, well, let's see. Motorcycles are, are kind of a big part of Japanese culture. What's the... the reception when a big group like, you know, a MotoQuest tour or something like that pulls into a small town? Well, really, the Japanese uh, in general keep to themselves, and they're very, um, they won't go out of their way to make a big deal out of a big deal. 
but you can tell it's a head turner, especially when we have lady riders uh, and they take their helmet off. It's pretty cool. But Japan, I believe, is even more of a motorcycle culture than what the United States is. Uh, per capita, they ride. And the ones that do ride have invested a lot of time, effort, and money to get their license. So they take it very seriously. And uh, so you're going to see more motorcycles over there than what we're used to over here, per capita for sure. Uh, and But when you see uh, a group of foreigners like us actually riding over there, uh, it really gets their attention. They'll come over. They're very curious, but there's usually a language barrier, and that's where uh, either Chie or I can come over and we can help the conversation go, or maybe it's just taking pictures because it's not beyond them to come over and, and just want to get a picture with you. And so there is a little bit of stardom going on uh, because it is very rare to see uh, a group of foreigners on motorcycles there. Well, it's cool that uh, that you guys get to bring that, you know. Um... Okay, so this one is a little bit more of just a day-to-day uh, -day functionality on the tour thing. Um, this question's about the gear. How do you handle it when you're off the bike when you're traveling there? Uh, or really, in general, you know, I'd be, I'd be very interested to hear what Brendan has to say about some of the other locations, too. Um, is it generally safe to leave it on the bike, or do you have to carry it with you? Um, you know, if you bring it in, is there some place to leave it? It's usually on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and we brief the group pretty well on where and when to take their stuff inside. We've come up with a lot of tricks as well for keeping your stuff safe if you are in an area where you need to protect your stuff. You can tuck it in the support vehicle if you want to kind of walk away and take a photo. Um, some of our guys use bicycle locks that they string through their gear and their helmet and lock it to the bike just to keep the honest honest. Yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. In the case of Japan, you have to go... You, there, it's very difficult to get something stolen. It's such an honest society. It's really uh, remarkable. I even left a video camera at the bus, at the main train station in Hiroshima. I came back and it was already in Lost and Found and they were looking for me. Uh, they, you can leave your helmet, your kit, everything on the bike and walk away from it and literally leave it and you never worry about it. And that's one of the, I think it's one of the great um, aspects of coming to Japan because there, there are a few things that can only really work there, and that's one of them. Yeah, it must be really nice. You know, I don't even like leaving it in the parking lot anywhere around here, you know? <laughs> um, okay, so this one's another kind of um, just travel technicality question. Uh, let's talk about cash. Do you have to carry cash? Is it a cash culture? Can you get by on credit cards? Um, and if you if you do need to use a card, is there um, a specific place you have to do it or anything specific you have to do with your bank, maybe? Well, uh, Japan is a very cash-over-counter country, and it no matter how many times I tell people before they travel there, they s tend to think that they can get an ATM around the corner because it's such a technologically advanced country. But really, uh, that's the way they do business. Uh, you have to have cash on hand. And if you try to uh, rely on just um, exchanging for yen when you get to Japan, uh, you might be uh, very surprised that they won't accept all of your bills. And so you might not. You might need a budget a little bit different. I highly recommend that you get your yen before you come over. And if you want to rely on ATMs, it can be a severe hassle. There are only few and far between. And sometimes they don't work. Uh, I wouldn't rely on it at all. Um, since all the, the food, for the most part, except for lunches, is already paid for and all the accommodations, really all you got to worry about is gas. And we just do a sort of a, we figure it out and divide it between the group at the end of the trip. And so you can pay later. So really you just need a, if you're a shopper, you need to get enough, uh, you know, yen for your alcoholic beverages and, and uh, your lunches. But please don't rely on your credit card. Um, it's it's a head shaker, but it, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. <laughs> that's that's really good advice. There's nothing worse than getting stuck, you know, with no cash, no uh, no way to use your your credit cards, anything like that. Um, okay, so that's good to know. Um, let's get back to the riding portion of it. How how is the riding situation there? How are the roads? Um, you know, you mentioned that the the route that you guys laid out is is 
you know, some of the best riding in the area. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, um, we try to go into the countryside as much as possible. Lots of steep um, mountains, lo- thousands of curves, uh, lots of uh, very beautiful uh, pastoral scenes, you know, farms. Uh, it's left side of the road driving, and you really want to get that down by at least the third intersection. Uh, you want to stay on the left as much as possible. Uh, the 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 speed limit is very low, um, and that's probably the biggest complaint that I get is that we don't go very fast. And the thing is, you really can't. Um, and if you do, they the you will get a traffic ticket. So you do have to stay at a very moderate pace. So it's really more of a a scenic uh, buffet than it is. Um, you know, just a, a speed or a velocity uh, style ride. Uh, we keep the group more or less together when we're going across country. Uh, reading the signs in Japan is very difficult, if not impossible for a foreigner. I've had it said to me by world travelers that Japan is one of, is the most difficult uh, country that they've ever traveled in because of the language barrier. and. It does not cater to uh, foreigners, uh, so you can get lost easy. There's thousands of roads to choose from, so what we'll do is we'll do a buddy system. We go over it every day, and we try to help each other connect everybody as a group when we go. There are several days where we'll get in early, and that's when we can cut you loose, and you can go do your own ride, and you can go discover something on your own. And I like to do that as much as possible, but when we're going across country, we just can't afford to do that. We're just... Mm-hmm. We're really uh, quite fortunate if we can keep the group together from one point to another. With you know, in a, being born and raised in Alaska, there's four roads, but uh, in Japan's a little different. So yeah. um, uh, I would say, other than that, all you know, being that it's on the left side of the road, I don't think there's anything uh, else that's out of the ordinary, other than just maybe the low velocity that you're usually riding on. But trust me, there's enough to, to see while you're riding even at that slow pace, that it's overwhelming. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Well, coming from somebody with a view like that behind you, you know, that's, that's saying something, that it's overwhelming, you know? <laughs> um, so, okay, let's, let's say the worst happens. Let's say somebody gets lost, somebody gets separated. Um, how do you guys handle that? You know, and, and Brendan, I'm going to open this one up to you, too. Um, it, does MotoQuest have, like, a policy in place or anything like that for any of its adventures, or is there a kind of a unique situation in Japan um, that you guys have to handle with something like that? I would say Japan is just the same as anywhere else. So, Brendan, go for it. Feel this one. Uh, Typically, I tell my guys if they suddenly realize they're lost, the best thing they can do is stay still. If they start wandering around, they're getting further and further away from the designated route. Um, We usually send the guide back or if we have a sweeper or even the support truck driver, but a lot of it is just making sure your riders know where they're going, that they have maps, and using the buddy system. As Phil says, the buddy system always works until it doesn't. So. <laughs> um, how about keeping in contact? Uh, there's a the question on the list here about um, getting like an international phone plan or something like that. Uh, Japan has kind of its own phone system, if I remember correctly, so most cell phones don't work there, correct? Yeah, it's a little bit funny, and it seems to change year to year. Uh, it, you know, sometimes uh, a few years ago, you needed to have a local telephone. And in order to get one, you needed to have a local uh, sponsor you to get the phone. So it wasn't so easy. And then I went there with my iPhone, and I had trouble connecting, and uh, I finally got it to work. Of course, I did the magical turn it off and turn it back on. And it <laughs> did work. Uh, but... Here again, you know, I wouldn't rely on your communication to work there. We bring a sat phone, and most of my uh, guests have had trouble with their phones over there. But the sat phone's already always there if they want to. It's three dollars a minute. They can talk to whoever they want, and I always offer it every night. Some people need to make a connection or something like that, and you have that. But really, if you uh, you know prepare yourself to be uh, without communication, you're, you're better off mentally. Uh, if you, you can make a uh, Japan phone-specific plan, uh, but I've also seen that fail. So, uh, and it's funny because uh, that, along with that, it goes with the Internet. Um, Japan, of all the countries we go to, seems to have the 
really lacking in internet uh, accessibility. Even in the deep uh, places of Patagonia, you can get on the internet easier than you can in a downtown Japanese hotel. And uh, it's beyond me why it's that way. It's just there's one question that you don't put in your bag and pack it over to Japan with, and that is why. Because it really doesn't get you anywhere. You just stay away from it, and you'll be all right. And that's I tell everybody that, and I go through it all week. We're not, we're not supposed to use that word. We're not. And there's so many head-scratching things there, but you're talking about a culture that's had a, a written history of 6,000 years, but before that they have always been on their own. They have a very uh, strong identity and a way of doing things that is uh, very unique to any other country. And when you get there, the word why is going to come up all the time because it's never been westernized. Uh, not in the way that most countries in the world have. It was never colonized. So these, they have their own um, uh, the way of talking with their, their physical uh, sense, and they also have a, a way of just being that doesn't really make all that much sense to us sometimes. Even though other things are just, they make sense, why don't we do that? And so it, it's part of it. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, okay. So let's talk, um, you know, travelers insurance, visas, stuff like that. Are there any particular steps that people need to take before they go on either, you know, one of your tours or just traveling there in general? Uh, we always recommend that you take uh, travelers insurance out just in case you have to cancel last minute or something like this. Uh, it's always a good idea. And we also um, work with a couple companies that uh, – help you in case there's uh, an emergency and they can life flight you out. Um, we recommend that for sure. Uh, th be aware though in Japan it's not that remote to anything uh, so if you if anything should happen you're in good hands and you're gonna have very uh, high quality uh, medical service or anything right there on the spot. That's for sure. Uh, but uh, what was the second part you said? Oh, uh, I had you know travelers insurance and uh, visas actually listed as as one of the questions on here. Is that necessary for something like a, uh, a MotoQuest tour? No, uh, it depends on what country you're from. But uh, so far, and we've had people from Ecuador, Australia, Canada, South Africa, United States, uh, England, and none of them needed to get um, a visa. But we do we do have some travelers that do need to get visas from Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia. So it just depends on what country you're coming from. But there's only a few countries that do need to get uh, a visa before they go. Okay. Um, well, that covers pretty much everything. Uh, I actually do have one more question about the weather. You know, you mentioned some microclimates, stuff like that. Um, what kind of gear should people plan to bring? And this really applies to most of our trips. I think Brendan can agree that uh, you try to plan for anything from just around freezing to just around 90 degrees. And if you can layer up or layer down and have a waterproof uh, a layer somewhere in there, you're going to be okay. And that goes with your gloves too. The biggest uh, problem I see with a lot of our riders is uh, they – they can, but they don't uh, prepare for rain, and it can rain. I mean, the word typhoon, you know, came from there. <laughs> so, it, it can, you know, uh, as long as you're prepared and you can stay water uh, tight and dry, uh, you're going to be at least a lot more comfortable. And that's what I would tell people is just make sure you have uh, everything for four seasons. Always good advice. Um, okay, I think that kind of wraps everything up here. Thanks, everybody. Um, Brendan, if people want to participate in a MotoQuest tour, why don't you run us through the sign-up process? Uh, sign-up process, typically in the end, you always need to fill out a registration form just to make sure we have all of your information. But we always encourage riders to call in. Um, our toll-free number is 1-800-756-1990. There's somebody there at least six days a week, if not seven days a week, depending on the time of the year, to answer your questions and steer you in the right direction. Um, on our website, we list all of the contact information for all of our guides who can help you out as well if you want to talk to a guide before you go on your trip. And that's all on MotoQuest.com. 
<laughs> All right, cool. All right, well, that brings everything to a close. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. Uh, if you have any further questions, you can contact us through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, uh, or on the website, or even in the comments on this video. So uh, thank you, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you next time.